pieces. And I was like, this is a treasure, right? And then we destroyed the penny because we tried to use iron oxide and we wrecked it. But it, it was an amazing find and I, I loved it. But it sparked something in me. And the next week, I went back and I started digging around all over the place and I got in trouble. <laughs> and, they, and they said I couldn't do that anymore. I was causing all kinds of damage. Well, the next year, I was exploring an old garage and I found an old ancient silver dollar. And I started to have something something stir inside me. It was like, how far back do these go? You know, where do they come from? How do they end up here? And it was like something that was forming and starting in me at a young age. And really what happened was it blossomed later in my life to unraveling my own mystery, to being able to take all the things that I'd explored and not even imagined that I could have a mystery to explore myself. But not just a regular mystery, something that's, you know, something small, but how about potentially the greatest mystery of all? The mystery of who we are, where we come from, and the very identity of where our divinity and the ancient ascension teachings around the world that were forgotten and that we forgot who we really are. And I believe that when you see the end of this presentation, you might think very differently about history and reality than you ever did when you walked in this room. And so for those who don't know my work, this picture is a temple that I believe will change all of history. But before we get to that, we have to start at the beginning. The beginning starts for me with what arguably is an obsession over ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian history. Literally an obsession. Um, I don't know if a lot of people are, would sit up at 2 o'clock in the morning wondering what the translation on Tablet 2 of the Adrahasis is. But that's what I do. And I studied it for years and years and years, and it was something that I couldn't put down. And I kept exploring it, and I kept seeing these incredible similarities around the world to an ancient narrative that was far older than we've been told. An ancient narrative that would predate conventional history by more than 10,000 years. In fact, maybe more than 20,000 years old. And that started with looking at the ancient lineage of the last Sumerian king in our history. For those who haven't read the Sumerian tablets, the Sumerian king list is an ancient set of tablets that actually is mimicked by another set of tablets called the Uruk List of Kings and Sages, or even something like the Barocious King List or Legend of Itzubar. You see these comparisons over and over again of these original five cities that were lowered down and were created here. And conventional mainstream archeologists and uh, scientists would tell you that this occurred somewhere around five to 6,000 years ago and was a localized type of situation where if they discussed a flood or some kind of a catastrophic event, it was localized to their region because their world was small. It wasn't encompassing, but I think that entire viewpoint is wrong. And what they experienced in ancient Sumer was literally like the end of the world. And what came out of that became the very core of our story. Now look at the bottom of what I circled there. You see that at the top it starts with Eridu, this concept of kingship, these laws and rules and governing that would like create civilizations. But at the very end, it ends with this last city of Shurupak. And you see there that the king was known as Ubar Tutu. Well, Ubar Tutu had a son. And his son, his name was Zaya Sudra Untapishtam. And he was, in all intents and purposes, he was the biblical Noah. All of these other, whether they're Christian, Hebrew text, they come from an, an earlier origin point, something that's ancient. And they talk about this end of the world deluge and this family and this bloodline of, of ancient kings that survived this event, but the whole thing was a myth. It was a legend. It was something that most people didn't think was real. They, mainstream academics discredited it, walked right past it, didn't even look at it. But I couldn't get past it. 
there was something absolutely incredible about this Sumerian civilization and these stories that I read every single one I could. And before I knew it, I, was, I had read every cuneiform tablet that I could get my hands on, every single one. And I cross-referenced them, and I found it fascinating because I found out that the Untapishtim figure, the Noah figure, was far more important than we've been told. It seems to be the very core of our entire story. Now, I want to preface this by saying I absolutely believe that primitive, primitive indigenous groups were existing around the world. Absolutely. But this is something different. What we had happen here is the creation of civilization that arose out of nothing and literally led to, I believe, everything that we have now. And that starts with the end of the Sumerian civilization. They, again, they describe it being destroyed in a catastrophic flood and the survivors of that going off and, and ending up somewhere. Now, before we get to where they ended up, how are we going to prove that that story is older than we're told? How are we going to prove, if we have evidence, we can't just keep speculating. We can't speculate because we've speculated too long. And that's why it's time to put some real science into this. And I'm going to be joined by other experts, including archaeologists in the future on this research, who agree with me that the history that we're told and the time periods that we're told are wrong. And that is what we're going to show here. Now, on your screen, you're seeing the actual original uh, drawings from the first expedition that ever went into ancient Mesopotamia to search for this mythical city called Shurupak. Which is interesting in itself, because if they didn't believe it was real, why would you go search for it? So I found that rather peculiar in, that, in the own sense, especially because of the conclusion at the end of their paper basically ties it directly to it, and they speculate wildly. But I want to just first take you in to understand, um, maybe in a deeper way, of why this is so important. So this is an image taken from 1931, from the Penn Museum out of Philadelphia, right here in the United States, who was researching and they realized that they believed they knew where Shurupak was. So they literally led an entire expedition across the world to the middle of the desert to see if they could find this mythical city of Shurupak. Now I wanna read for you the beginning of what they said on this when you can experience it. Now imagine they, they ride out, it takes a week a week from the nearest road to get to here. They ride out in the middle of the desert and they set up camp on where they believe, based on studying ancient maps, that this, this mythical city is. This is what they say when they got there. In our memory, Farah, which is the, the modern day version of Shurupak, but on top, so like a later civilization. In our memory, Farah camp will live on as a strange, forlorn spot in the Mesopotamian desert. We shall think of the furious sandstorms sweeping across the alluvial plain and hurling barrages of dust on camp and mound. The weather-beaten walls of our temporary house trembled for days under the assault of the gales. Our makeshift canvas roofs were torn to shreds. Bricks thudded down from the crumbling wall tops, the contours of which were fantastic in the fog of dust and sand. Though blinded and matted at times by the continuous raging of elements, we tried to work on, and it rarely happened that we, it rarely happened that the whistle sounding announcement at the end of the day's work and resignation for the time being, that the situ situation became catastrophic only when sandstorms followed by cloud bursts at night. Talk about intense sandstorms for days, then intense thunderstorms but they didn't give up. They waited it out, writing about the experience until the weather finally cleared. And when it did, they started one of the most important excavations that, is, that has never been known in history. Something that went under the radar that very few people know about that we're gonna track down and get to the very heart of. This is, these are actual photographs from the expedition, all of these. The originals from 1931. Now, I want to show on the screen that, that uh, those areas that they're excavating with those layering down um, to, to look at different civilizations, 
you're only seeing the first half. That goes down more than double that picture. It's unfortunate we didn't get a picture of that. But imagine as they're going down, they, found not, they find not one civilization, but three. Three distinctive civilizations that had existed in the exact same spot. Now, can you imagine how confusing that would be to archaeologists? When they're looking at that, if you're trying to think of a 6,000-year time frame, how are you going to th have three civilizations separated by over 30 feet of sediment? And if anybody doesn't know, that takes an enormous amount of time to create that kind of sediment. That's, that's windblown sand and dust accumulating over thousands of years. Now, what's fascinating is that we've been told there's only one culture in that region, the original Sumerians, right? Well, as they were digging down, they found, when they were digging down, they found the first layer called Stratum 1. They found a very primitive civilization, roughly 12 inches down. Very primitive, um, very uh, basic pottery. No cuneiform tablets at all. They didn't even, in fact, that civilization that was on top didn't even know how to write in cuneiform. Okay, so that's a far later culture. Now, as they're going down, they get down to about 20 feet or so, about 19, 20 feet, and they find a second civilization. This civilization is a little bit more advanced. Their art is a little bit more impressive. They start to find cuneiform tablets. The entire group is, co is convinced that that's it. That's the whole story. 75% of the expedition leaves. They leave because why would they leave? Well. There's not supposed to be anything below there. There isn't. It's like a mystery area. You get down there, you're like, okay, we're all done. Let's go home. Well, the people who were on the project, a couple of the archaeologists, they said, no, no, no. We, I, think, I think they knew. They knew what they were looking for, and they knew that wasn't it. So 75% of everybody left. They had a skeletal crew. They dug down an additional 17 feet, and they found no human habitation, nothing, a, a 17 to 19 foot inundation layer of solid mud, solid mud. When they got down to 31 to 35 feet in this image, they found evidence of a highly advanced culture with incredible artwork and pottery and cuneiform texts, and they found three tablets with the name Shurupak on them, proving that they had found the mythical city of Shurupak. Well, how could that be possible if it's a myth and it's not real? How could you find a civilization that's on the bottom that is highly advanced, and then you have a, you have a culture on the top that's primitive? How does that make sense in history? That's backwards. We're supposed to have a linear growth of acceleration development, and yet we find this highly advanced time period that then goes down to a primitive iron and bronze age time. We're looking at the remnants, potentially the, one of the only places on earth that we can actually find evidence to prove that the story is true. And because of these excavations from Penn Museum, we are launching an entire expedition scientifically to prove this to the world. And the, this site is the first place that starts this. And it begins in, in the archives of Penn Museum, where they found this. And that is where we're going to continue down this rabbit hole, because what Shurupak proves is it proves that the story, the ancient Zayasudra story of, of the last Sumerian kings in the deluge, in this time long before we can ever imagine, just as Gilgamesh is told when he goes on his, his search for immortality and he meets the same Zayasudra figure. He, he tells him that Shirupak is from a time far more ancient than him. And that's where we know. We know because there's those little clues left behind in those tablets. And you only would know that if you studied them like a nerd like I do. And that's, and that's, but that's what it really led to. Now, the tablets, though, specifically a tablet called the Atrahasis, contains the best version of understanding this figure because it was written by Zayasudra. Now, Zayasudra wasn't just any king. He was a high priest 
one of the most noble and knowledgeable of anyone in that region. And he was from a sacred ancient bloodline that tied all the way back, and that's why they were ruling over these, these cities. Now, in the Atrahasis, you find that there's a catastrophic event that goes through, which is what that 19-foot inundation layer is. And they even called it that, an inundation layer in the archaeological reports. It shows that they had to build something to survive the end of the world. It talks about bitumen and creating this, this object, of it, like a boat almost, but something that could survive the end of the world. And it's very detailed in those descriptions in the tablets. Take the Hebrew side and the Christian side away for a minute. I have two of every animal and all those things. Imagine a family has a bloodline that needs to be preserved. It's like the end of mankind, and some of the, a lot of the gifts that are in us came from there. And if that was destroyed, we may never be where we are now. And that story ended, though, just mysteriously, because the tablets fracture off and break. You never know what happens. All you know is that they land somewhere around Mount Ararat. And I was stuck on that, that place for years, years and years and years, I had no idea where to go. It was like the, the trail had gone cold. There was no more clues. It, it was, it was, the trail was dead. I was stuck right there trying to figure out where it went. What's amazing about today is that it's nearly one year ago from when I uncovered this and connected it. It's almost exactly a year from, t from today. That's why I didn't present it last year. <laughs> but... This is where the mystery truly goes. This is where we can follow that, that cliche term, but this is truly the rabbit, to follow down that rabbit hole, okay? Now that starts with Lake Vaughan and Mount Ararat. Now, this is not really Turkey as it is today. It used to be ancient Armenia, okay? Now, Armenia is one of the, one of the most ancient regions in the world in terms of language, in terms of culture, they wrote in cuneiform, it's all here. Now, I had not noticed anything significant and hadn't seen anything, and that's why I, I just hadn't come across anything that would lead me here until I was exploring online and I saw these recent excavations from 2014 of a place called Zernaki Tepe. Now, Zernaki Tepe is sitting right at the northern edge of Lake Vaughan. Um, immediately when I saw a photograph of these excavations, I, my face turned white because I knew that it, these, this megalithic style of building should not exist here. This should not exist. It's an anomaly. Where else in Turkey are you going to find these types of megalithic walls in this type of precision and, and it gets better? This is, if anything, this would be the most primitive of, of these ancient sites, but it was the first one that I came across. And what made it remarkable was the connections to South America. The, the polygonal blocks looked extremely similar to Peru and the pre-Inca and the ancient sites through there. And I realized that something was going on here, and, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I was exploring how these connections could be linked anywhere. And that led me down a journey that has changed my entire life forever. And I will be exploring these mysteries for the rest of my career. The next site I discovered as I was exploring after Sinaki Tepe were these incredible underwater discoveries that were made under Lake Vaughan over 100 feet deep. They found the only megalithic wall in the world that's underwater. Nowhere else in the world can you find a megalithic, highly advanced temple wall that exists underwater. The Egyptian stuff and the stuff off Greece, is, it's not megalithic, it's more primitive. So this is peculiar. Again, just like Zernaki Tepe, it shouldn't exist. It's out of time and out of place. And that really got my attention. You could call the underwater stuff that spark for me. Because Zernaki Tepe got me very curious, but this got me driven. So I was like, I knew that 
if you were able to create, from my understanding of cult cultural advancement over time, you have to have a culture so highly advanced that they've mastered agriculture, mastered commerce, mastered metallurgy, mastered animal husbandry to ever get to the point where you would have stonemasons that are advanced enough to be able to create megalithic walls. Why? Because it takes a tremendous amount of resources. You cannot just be like, hey, you guys go over there and build that wall. It would take a significant amount of your finest skilled craftsmen your finest, the people you have in your culture, to even attempt to do this, which means that it can only come from a highly advanced culture. Knowing that, I knew that it means there's a lot more because you can't have an isolated site from an advanced culture. It has to be a large area. That's the only way a civilization would be able to represent that from. So when people are saying they see like an obscure little wall somewhere, you got to have evidence of a civilization around. I know it's fun to try to like match up stones and think that there are ancient sites, but we have to put real science behind this. And that is where this civilization, this lost civilization, kept growing and growing and growing. And I imagine this isn't even close to the end. You can only imagine how many other sites have not even been discovered yet. Now this gives you a map before you've seen some of them. But I wanted to give you an overview to see the scope of this. Because right now, we're looking at, just on this map, at least five sites, at least five, from this mysterious, incredible civilization that left behind some of the finest precision stonework in the world. Now, this site was the third site I had found. Now, when I found Cavus Tepe, or came across it, I should say. This was the one that connected the whole narrative in a greater way. For, now, for those who have never seen this site, or perhaps you've seen it online with people that confuse it with being something in Peru, because that's actually how I found it. Somebody shared Cavus Tepe and said that it was from Peru. And I was like, that's not Peru. <laughs> and then the, I have to, whoever that was, thank you, because because that, honestly, there was like these breadcrumbs, these keys. They were like laying around all over the place, but you had to put them together. Now, if you look at this for a second, you'll notice that I've highlighted in yellow or gold what is very primitive limestone sandstone work, okay? Now, notice in the, in the square right here, right there, that they tried to rebuild this ancient site. So what you're seeing is anything that's a sedimentary sandstone came from a culture more than five, potentially more than 10,000 years later. And they tried to mimic it, but notice they didn't use any of the same stone. This stone that you see in blue is basalt. It's one of the hardest stones on earth. It's a six to six and a half on the most hardness scale, whereas that stone that you see around it is like a three. We're talking about something where the people that use the tools to create the, that, that softer stone, it would have been impossible for them to even manipulate that harder stone. Now, why is there stuff underneath, though, that's lighter and, more, and less sophisticated? I believe that this site was put back together by that civilization in an attempt to rebuild an ancient world, okay? And we're going to get into that as we get going, because this is just the beginning, this is what blew my mind. In our ancient Armenia and in their history, if you ask any Armenian right now, you call up an Armenian, you'd be like, who's the founder in, of our ancient Armenia? They would go, King Hike. They all know it's their patron saint that created their entire culture. All right? The, Armenia exists because, according to them, because of King Hike. Now, in just the locals of that region, they already call this place Hikeburg, which is very fascinating because King Hike is a direct descendant of the Noah figure. If we take off the biblical, the Proto-Georgian, and the Armenian, if we would have a Sumerian chart in there, you would see Zaya Sudra at the top, and then Japheth, and then followed by the names below. So substitute Noah with Zayasudra, okay? And that is what you're looking at, is the most ancient and the most sacred knowledge that was passed 
by cultures that knew this connection that we forgot. Now, I want to go back to this for a second. This is a painting done from uh, in ancient Armenia, and it's just funny how much truth is just hidden all around us in things that maybe we take for granted. Because just read what it says down there below. The tomb of Bel. You know who Bel was? Anybody know who Bel was? Bel Marduk. Bel Marduk was from Babylon, okay? So first of all, that. And the second thing is that it depicts this battle they fought here, which, whatever that means, but it talks about how Lake Vaughan region, Mount Ararat with Noah's Ark. It's kind of been sitting there all along in front of us, but we didn't have the pieces to put together yet. Now, here is an ancient Hebrew uh, account of these ancient lineages. Now, notice that you see very specific colors for where they went. And as I've studied this, the more, and I might move, like, for instance, Shem and Ham around a little bit. But other than that, it looks pretty accurate in my opinion. Where these sons seem to have gone out and created the new world. Now, some people are going to ask me, and I've never showed this, so people are going to love seeing this. What does the cuneiform at Cavus Tepe say? Well, I want you to pay attention to this figure called Haldi. All right, it's, it's really, it's, it's Haldi, but I cannot say that over and over again. It's way too hard on my, on my vocals, okay? Um, notice that it's not built by a man. Haldi isn't a man. Haldi's a god. Haldi is the god of the Urartian civilization later. But to this culture, he's the creator of the entire civilization, according to them. Now, King Hike would be like a bloodline king that's a descendant of them. That's where you get the connection there. But notice that it's not talked about being built by Rusa II. Now, if you go look at this and you go look it up, you'll see every, every archaeologist is saying it's built by Rusa II. It doesn't say that here, does it? And I want to be careful and cautious for anybody who's exploring this world of ancient history. Be careful because there is a narrative that is fiercely protected and anything that doesn't fit in doesn't exist. And that's why it's time for us to rewrite the new story. Now, this is a quote from Cavus Tepe which I believe is one of the most important ancient sites in history, and we're going to be exploring this on the expedition. But here's a quote, because, I mean, does anybody see any fences? Does anybody see anything that's been coordinated off where they're, they're working on stuff or they're protecting stuff? Could, could, could anybody be prevented from walking up on this hill and taking something home? Well, there are actually artifacts that I've found that are seen on images that are at this site Bass cell artifacts sitting on the ground you could walk home with. That is appalling. That is so disrespectful that it's, it makes me angry to my core, okay? If you were going to have something disappear like, like Eridu, which I've talked about, if some people know in here, you would just have it kind of be forgotten and then left to the wolves. And meaning like whatever happens, Right? And that's exactly what happened here. Now, Cavus Tepe was excavated and discovered in 1958. Has anybody heard of it in here from that discovery in 1958? What happened? How come nobody in the world knows about this? Well, this quote right here kind of explains that and sums it up pretty well, doesn't it? You just walk around wherever you want. You're like, whatever, right? That's not okay. These sites should be protected. They should be coordinated off. People should not be able to walk around and mess and destroy things. This is not okay. But what it shows you is that this is a site that they don't care about. And it just so happens to be one of the missing keys, I think, in this entire story, which is telling in itself. Another example. Welcome to Kef Kalesi, or Kef Temple, discovered at the same time, the same year, as Kevis Tepe. Don't you think maybe they were, they were trying to find something? But then when they found it, what happened? The world didn't know about it. It disappeared. 
And that's what is so incre incredibly important about this work. Because look at Cavastepi. Those are basalt blocks from an ancient temple on top of a mountain looking over, over, over the lake. Again, an extremely hard stone, incredibly precise. Looks like something out of Egypt or Peru, right? And look at it once again. Does anybody see any fences or anything protecting the site? Where else in the world besides Iraq or Syria can you see that? Nowhere. You cannot see archaeological digs and excavations left like that. It is, uh, it is very telling and it's very sad. But we're going to, I promise you, we're going we're gonna to do the right thing, even if it came 75 years too late. Okay. Now, this is what was found at that site. Now, imagine finding what could arguably, arguably be one of the most important artifacts in history. By the way, that is over three feet by three feet by four feet. It's massive. It's made out of solid basalt, and it's one of the finest carved stone relics in the world. Now, when they found that, they didn't find it at the temple, though. They found it tossed over 500 feet down the mountain on, this, on the edge of the hillside, and they excavated it. The archaeologists from 1958, 1959, and 1960 were baffled by this relic. They couldn't understand it, how it could fit into the Artean civilization. And subsequently, it was then brought to the old Museum of Vaughan, and there's a new one there now, and it was left in the outdoor garden for 20 years. 20 years it remained in a garden with flowers growing around it and nobody cared. And that is, um, is rapidly changing though right now. Now, these symbols on it, I could, I could literally spend the entire presentation today talking about this. Just that right there and what it means and what the implications are for it. But we don't have time for that. So we're, if you want to dig deeper, you can always get into my work in a deeper level. But let's get into some of the, some of the highlights of it, okay? We'll call it the overview, look at it. Now, you haven't seen Ionis yet, but we'll get into that in a second. But look at the comparisons first of those two figures, okay? They're nearly identical, and they are identical. They're the same, they're the same influence, the same being. Let's call it a celestial being for a good way to terminology for it, okay? So you see the similarities there. Now look at the similarities with the same mural from the Ashurbanipal Library with the winged gods in the same depiction of passing, look in the hand of the two figures on the left, the outside, left and right, and look at what Haldi's passing. It's the same thing. He's passing the seeds of knowledge, the seeds of knowledge that then passed around the world and then also created this. This is from not the Sumerians, as some might think, this is from the Assyrians, and this is from a later time period where the knowledge from Lake Vaughan, I believe, traveled back into this region because the original Sumerians were all destroyed. And this is from a later time period, but it shows the influences that it started here and then passed around to other parts of the world. Now, this is where you get down the rabbit hole deep. This is where it starts getting almost a little bit creepy but amazing at the same time. Imagine a puzzle that the pieces all fit perfectly together and they were scattered around the world in a way where we had to try to find them like a scavenger hunt, left behind for us for a time where we could finally understand, a time where we finally had the maturity of our consciousness to understand this on a deeper level and then those mysteries would be revealed. I believe that is what's happening right now as we enter this age of Aquarius, is that these mysteries that have been remained hidden for so long are finally being unveiled. Now what you're seeing in front of you, notice that symbol on the box that's on the right side, it's known as a step pyramid. Doesn't that look like a ziggurat? It is a ziggurat. It was their version of a pyramid, okay? but they embodied in it the actual teachings of what they were trying to show in a physical level. Three, this concept of three. Three levels, three doors, three aspects of us, okay? Now that, look at those symbols for a minute on that, in the circle. Now notice there's an inverted version too, you see that? There's the non-inversion and then there's the inverted version. And it represents realms of a reality. 
So like the non-inverted version would be like in this realm of earth, the third dimensional physical realm. And I believe the other ones have to do with other realms of reality. Let me show you what I mean. Notice across the world, in South America, you see the combining of both symbols, known as the jacana. They combined them as above, so below, into one totality. And it exists there, and that's just the beginning. On the other side of the world, in Madain Saleh in Saudi Arabia, you see the same thing. There it is. It's everywhere. It was spread from one point and traveled around the world. Now, for those who don't know, Medain Soleil is absolutely amazing. And I promise you we will have an expedition going there in the future. Medain Soleil, imagine a desert in the middle of nowhere. And you create incredible temples in these vertical rocks in the middle of the desert. And you don't live there. You've got pilgrimages out there. Ancient kings and priests, when they want to have moments of reaching higher states of consciousness or communicating with the gods, they would have a pilgrimage out to these remote places and these temples, and they would go in, and I believe they were seeking these, these, the highest states of consciousness that we had ever obtained in our, in our entire history. These people were masters. They were masters of their reality, and they understood things in a way that we did not understand. Now look at this, identical to that shape. This is Oyete Tambo in Peru with a sacred spring flowing over the very top with the three levels inside it. You see that? Carved out of basalt, the same symbol from across the world. Now, it gets even better. Here is... Arguably, I just showed you all that stuff. You'd be like, seriously? Like, there's more? There's more? This makes all those other sites seem like proxy sites, okay? I believe that Ionis will change the entire world in the future. I think that Ionis contains the greatest secrets of humanity. I really do. And I think Ionis is a sacred, sacred site that... For those who don't know, it was not found during the time of Kavis Tepe and, and uh, Kef Temple. It was from a different time. They, they started excavating the lower walls in 1989, and it took them 30 years to get to the central temple. 30 years. 30 years of digging, knowing they're getting to something. Why would you dig for 30 years unless you knew you were, there was something you were going to find? Imagine that. Imagine having workers where you're working on the lower levels, you're finding megalithic walls, but you're saying, no, 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 there's something at the top. Like, we know that the temple would be at the top. So you spend 30 years, and when you finally reach the temple, you excavate down, and you find something you'd never imagined. You find what I believe is the oldest temple on Earth. On Earth. Welcome to Ionis. Ionis is strange. It's out of place. The archaeologist that's working on this with me, named Jennifer Deo, when she first saw this site, she told me this. She says, I have never seen a site like that anywhere in the world. I said, no one has. Because there's no other place in the world that has a site like this. This shows you the, the archaeologists that are in there excavating now, I highlighted, once again, the differences of the stonework you can see in here, which is absolutely so obvious. It's like almost silly. Now, the brown layer on top is the eroded brick work that they did. And on the right side, actually, if you see on the right side of that wall, you can still see some of the bricks that haven't eroded. But it, on the rest of it, you can see that they've eroded to the point where they literally look like dirt. Why do they look like that? Well, because they used literally sedimentary stone to create brick, mud and bricks that literally can't last more than a couple thousand years. So it just disappears. Well, what doesn't disappear? Well, how about the andesite stone you see in that temple? Andesite and basalt, but mostly andesite. Now, if you were amazed by basalt, how about the fact that andesite is even harder than basalt? In fact, andesite, besides granite, is one of the hardest stones on earth. Now, here is a recreation of what they think 
that Ionis Temple looked like. And I would agree. I think they did a pretty good job here. Look at the top of the temple. You see that shape at the very top? It's the Ziggurat Step Pyramid, okay? Connecting to this whole thing on a deeper level. And we'll get into that in a second. Now here is looking into, into Ionis Temple. Now imagine Ionis Temple being such a sacred temple that nobody could enter it unless you were the highest priest or highest level of king. Nobody could enter it. If you entered it, you were probably killed. Because it was so sacred that the actual journey in, walking in, was like a journey in itself. You were, you were approached by three pillars on each side with writing that talked about it being the finest created temple in the world. Created by Haldi just like Cavus Tepe. Notice the stonework looks just like Cavus Tepe because they were built by the same people. Now, that, uh, that person there is a wonderful man that I very much look forward to working with. His name is Professor Izikli, and he's responsible for all of this. And so I commend him for that. They painfully put together this entire temple because when they discovered it, there was evidence of catastrophic damage catastrophic damage from potentially coronal mass damage uh, evidence to tsunami evidence and everything under the sun. They spent 10 years reconstructing this temple. 10 years. And they did such a beautiful job. And I really, I really appreciate everything they did. Now that stone, though, look. It is not the same thing as the stone on top again, just like Cavus Tepe. It's the same thing. You see this primitive sedimentary stone, but look at how they're mimicking. See the pillars, and they continue it up further. They're just trying to mimic the same civilization underneath, but they didn't know how to use the same, cut the same stone or anything. They're just trying to mimic it, and of course, over time, that became lost. But see that wall in front of you? That is an altar, Okay. Now, I don't have an image of it on here, but the altar shows, for those who are wondering, and I can show if you want to see it. I have a picture of it I can show you know, later. But the altar shows the god Haldi with chains encircling him around trees of life. Chains. Does anybody ever, if anybody's ever listened to my work, you remember that quote from the Atrahasis that I read, that I've read many, many times, that says, Enki, where you went, you were to undo the chains and set us free. I don't think it's any coincidence that we see those chains here being shown at Ionis. I think it has to do with our story. I think something happened here, okay? Something profound happened here. Let's go in a little deeper. In the center, of course, you see the hallmark of this entire thing, this mysterious cross symbol that is bizarre and mysterious, right? And then you see God Haldi, and you see the hourglass and the griffin and the sun. So, okay, you put those together. This is a sun temple. And then the hourglass represents time, right? So it's a sun temple. They were keeping track of time, and it was a sun temple. But why is there a cross on it? Why is Haldi passing a cross? Why is he also protecting showing his hands around the sun, protecting it. Why is there a griffin? Well, you go into ancient Greece and you learn that the griffin was the most important of all of their symbols for being a guardian. The griffin was a guardian, and ancient civilizations believed that if you embodied these powerful creatures of our reality, for instance, the lion was their most important symbol, and which you saw Haldi was standing on, on the other box, the lion was the most important symbol to show strength, and the eagle was the most important symbol to show all seeing all above. So what happens when you combine a lion and an eagle? You get a griffin. And that is exactly why they used these symbols to show the ultimate guardians. But why would you need guardians? Why would guardians be needed? Well, I think they're the guardians of our reality. I think they're the guardians of balance and time. And I think what's here at Ionis was the passing of the most divine knowledge that had ever been passed on earth. It was the knowledge of how we could reach the greatest levels of ascension and consciousness, essentially bringing us back to the source. 
And not only that, but when you combine the teachings that are at Kef Temple, you see that it was part of ancient mystery schools in ancient ascension temples that had nothing to do with sacrifice, had nothing to do with cult worship or all these things that they're saying. They had to do with the very heart of who we are. I believe that that cross is the very first cross in all of history that predated every cross that we know of by thousands and thousands of years. Now, I don't have it on this slide, but it's interesting how if you look at a photon of light, under a microscope, it's exactly the same shape as that. If anybody after this call, go look up what a photon of light looks like. It'll blow your mind. So it's a temple to the sun, and it's a symbol for light. And it also happens to be like the symbol of four and balance and the cardinal points and the seasons and everything seems to encompass these two numbers. Two numbers only, three and four. Three and four seem to describe every single thing they wanted to say. Three was the totality of who we are. Four was the totality of everything, like the connection back to oneness and source, the balance of all. And I realized that they were just about passing that knowledge and teaching around the world. Now, here you go back. You're, you're in Pumapunku now in South America. Now, the cross isn't identical but you'll notice many of the other symbols from South America are very similar but slightly different. Like they took all of them and put their own spin on it. All of them. Like they, maybe there was some disrespect where you couldn't use the exact same one. Maybe, you, they, maybe they had to slightly alter it for their own culture. I don't know. But I can tell you that it, you see how the cross has three indentations inside? It's the teaching of three within that. Look. One, two, three. So it's the teachings within that that's going to show you that if you can reach the higher states of consciousness and balance the three sides of us, and we'll get into that in a second, you can basically reach oneness with the source and, and everything in the universe. So they're passing the ultimate knowledge of humanity here. Now, here you have pre-Christian crosses right here, okay? Now look on the, in the center where it says, the sun god symbol. You see that? That's the same cross from Ionis. And it is the cross from Ionis. Okay? Now look at the chicana up there, you see? It's another form of a cross. That chicana symbol is the same thing as the two step pyramids combined. It's been right in front of us all along. It's the very core of these teachings that passed around the world and then became the very core of a mystery that one of the most mysterious ancient groups in the world seemed to be protecting. What were the Knights Templar preserving? What did they know? What was this sacred order trying to preserve? I believe that they were preserving what was known as the old religion, the original origin point of who we really are, and the teachings that allowed us to reach that before they became confused and slightly controlled through monotheistic religions, Christianity and others. And that's because of some bad men. That's really all it is. But it's, it's interesting. So you take that Ionis cross and you go to the Knights Templar or riding around the world, right? If no one knows the story of them, they were protecting something sacred and they were, they were brought together as a sacred organization only to be later hunted down by the very same people that hired them and killed. They were trying to wipe something out. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Roman Empire changed the cross around during around 2,100 years ago, and it just so happens to coincide with this entire time period of this cross disappearing and the Christian cross emerging? Why do you think the Pope doesn't wear the Christian cross, though. Why does the Pope wear the Ionis cross? Why do the British royals have the Ionis cross? Now, it's not called the Ionis cross. It's called the Knights Templar cross or the Red Cross. And it's almost like they know, right? There's some kind of an ancient understanding that the Pope and the Knights Templar and the secret societies around the world understood. Now, how could sites like Cavus Tepe and Kef Temple get unearthed and all these things are discovered and they disappear unless some individuals knew what they were connected to? 
And so they bury the whole thing and disappears from history, only to be unearthed more than 50 years later. And that is why I believe that it is a mystery that goes to the very heart of everything. Now, on the screen, I want to show you something here. This is known as the Yuga Cycles, the Kali Yuga Cycles out of India. Now, the comparisons, by the way, if anybody wants to do this little extracurricular homework assignment, go look up Lord Indra and go do the, look at the comparisons with Haldi. They're identical. Lord Indra is Haldi. Okay? Knowing that, you find out that in India, they literally, and besides the, Ma the Maya did it as well, uh, but I think the, in India they perfected it. They mapped out the cycles, but not cycles of just the stars and, you know, it's your birthday. They mapped out the cycles of consciousness and energy that arise from a system that's been set in place long ago. So instead of thinking of this as random, imagine, again, go back to Ionis, all those things were passed there and lowered there and all these things were created, it's like you were trying to create the golden age, right? Isn't that interesting that if you were going to create a golden age, what you would do is you would lower, lower all the knowledge you possibly could. You would just be like, here, take all of it, right? Take it all and what are you going to do with it? Well, what do you do with it? Well, you go around the world and you build the greatest temples and pyramids we've ever known in history and you try to leave behind the greatest teachings we've ever known in history. But inherently built into the cycle, a golden age is supposed to always get knocked down. It's never supposed to be sustainable forever because that's not how it works. That's not how energy cycles work. And if Haldi is balancing these energy cycles and their guardians, it really brings up the question of whether or not they're actually governing these cycles. And that gets into the higher level thinking of wondering if this is all just like the Truman Show and their puppeteering reality based on cycles of energy and consciousness. About teachings, teaching us what we need to remember to get back to where we started. Now on this, you'll notice that I included a, a cylinder seal called VA243. Why would I put that next to the Kaliuga cycles? Well, it's fascinating that that cylinder seal came, is one of the only relics we have from the actual original Sumerian civilization. A lot of artifacts that people think are the Sumerian civilization are actually the Akkadian, Assyrian, and Babylonian civilizations. They're not the Sumerians. The Sumerians, they left behind things, but they were so old that we lost most of what they left behind. But we didn't lose this. What it shows you on this is you see the stars in the back. I believe they represent ages, okay? Processional ages. Now, the figure you see seated with the horns is known as Enki in ancient Sumer. Now, what he's passing to those figures, which, by the way, can you imagine if he stood up? Just point that out. But he's, pa what, do you, does anybody know what he's passing in this? Does anybody know? He's passing the plow. He's passing the very first thing that you need to create civilization. He's starting it all. It begins right here. He's passing the plow, the knowledge of how to create agriculture, how to create a golden age, how to leave the breadcrumbs to create a golden age. And that's why it's so fascinating that it seems to all be connected. The whole entire thing seems to be connected. And that's why I am leading an expedition with experts from around the world to trace this mystery, not just to Lake Vaughan, but to Peru, to Bolivia, and also Egypt. It looks like these sons of these ancient Sumerian lineages that are long ago lost truly did travel around the world, and they were, the, I believe, they were the great sages of history who passed around the world and created these incredible civilizations. And so we will be creating, we will be having an expedition as well as uh, capturing all of the discoveries in real time. We have archaeologists, scientists, megalithic experts that are going to go to these sites and we're going to say, it's enough speculation. It's enough people sitting up here pointing a bunch of slides out and saying what they believe. We're going there, boots on the ground, to explore this mystery to the highest degree with the greatest minds of our time to figure out if this truly is that missing key that's going to change all of history in the future. And I, based on that, 
created my, an entire company, my own media company, based on Ionis Legacy because I truly believe that that is the answer to everything. And so if anybody is interested in following this work or being a part of this, you can be a part of this movement to change history. Um, please go to the Stage of Time and check it out if you're interested, thestageoftime.com, because we truly have just begun. This is just the beginning. There's nothing that's going to stop us from getting to all these places and finally unlocking a mystery that hasn't been known for thousands of years. And that is what we're going to be doing as we move forward. So I appreciate everyone. And, you know, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>
Okay, of course you do. <laughs> um, uh, Amaramuru is the same T-shaped shape as on, it's, I don't have a picture of it on me right now, but this is a homework assignment for people who want to check it out. Look at this for a second. Now, on, on this box right there, it's hard to see, but in the center of uh, the two gods that are passing, this, there we go. In the center there where that red arrow crosses over, you see T-shaped pillars in the center. The same T-shaped pillars you see at Gobekli Tepe, the same T-shaped pillars you see in Menorca, Spain, the same T-shape you see in South America. But they changed the symbols slightly then. But what that means is that that knowledge of that symbol existed back far longer than we ever know and has a meaning that we don't understand anymore. And it's like we're trying to take these symbols that we have put false associations on because archaeologists believe that they're part of a war culture. And so they're, what they're saying is that, you see what, got, what Haldi's holding right there? They believe that that's a spearhead. Okay? A spearhead, a war spearhead, except it looks exactly like the tree of life below it, the seeds of tree life. So it's, it's an evolving understanding that is changing as we're going along, but it's basically something that we are taking these symbols and we're seeing that they're literally everywhere on the world and that it's, it's somehow connected to the ways that we reach the highest states of consciousness. Okay, who's that? Go ahead. So this writing right here, um, the first thing to, to let everybody know is, so cuneiform is actually a style of writing, it's not a language. And so uh, many cultures use cuneiform. This culture did, uh, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Syrians, the Babylonians, they all use cuneiform. Now this is a Urartu or pre-Urartu, Urartian uh, cuneiform writing, but I can't find the whole translation. I can't find it anywhere. Nobody has it. I have searched for this translation at this wall for more hours than I want to admit. And I can't find it anywhere. That Cavus Tepe wall that had the writing is the only translation I can find. Which is mysterious in itself, right? Look at all that writing on there. And now imagine though, if you were gonna, it was if you were walking into this ancient temple that was the most sacred temple of all, that writing is most likely something like the most the, the praising the superiority of the building and the gods and the things that were built there. But we don't know, which is sad because supposedly they can translate this. But again, I don't know why that hasn't been done in a comprehensive way. I don't know why. Go ahead. Yes. Well, remember that Shurupak, they found a 19-foot inundation layer, okay? 19 feet, meaning it's just a flood layer. It's a mud layer. That's all it is. It's a mud layer. So absolutely, I mean, we're talking about if you have an arid landscape and you have a massive catastrophic flood occur, you're going to have literally a wall of mud. A wall of mud. And actually, a wall of mud is a heck of a lot more dangerous than a wall of water, okay? You don't survive a wall of mud. You're done. You just, it just covers you over like cement, and you're preserved forever and lost. But that's what we're talking about here is massive catastrophic events that were so significant, and not, of course, it didn't wipe out the world and flood everywhere, but certain parts of the world, and again, why would this area be so susceptible? Well, look at, the, look at where Persian Gulf is, look at where the Mediterranean is, and look where the Black Sea is. If you had a massive series of tsunamis and catastrophic earth changes, you're basically getting water from every side. And I think that's why this part of the world had such catastrophic damage in discussions with floods in the past. Because there have, I've traced at least two. So not the Younger Dryas has been the only one. In fact, 
That event that destroyed Zaya Sudra, I believe, was from an entire other p flood before the Younger Dryas. So for those who don't know, before, long before 12,000 years ago, which is why I said I believe it's over 20,000 years old, this temple right here, because it doesn't make sense conventionally any other way. The whole point was that if these lost civilizations were being created, you wouldn't have them created during a time of catastrophe. It would be before. And it, all of it lines up with Plato's Timaeus and Critias with the destruction of Atlantis as well. The destruction of these civilizations is very clear. It was roughly 11,600 years ago, and we see that around the world. Very clearly, there was, that was the most catastrophic period of that, of that time, which is what I believe wiped globally these civilizations out. But they had, the original flood for the Sumerian kings was far before that. And for anyone who wants to dig deeper as you get into Egypt, the connection we have that we're looking into is with the Temple of Horus in Edfu and how the, t the teachings of Zeptepi and the alignments of Leo seem to coincide to a period that if we want to look at the stars and what makes the most sense on paper, it would have to have been somewhere around 40,000 years ago based on the precession of the equinox and the ages of Leo. So we'd have to go back. So the last age of Leo, right? So like, imagine the Sphinx, right? Used to be a lion. And the pharaohs came back and carved it and messed up its face, okay? Um, but this, imagine the Sphinx is like a guardian. It's just like the griffin. It's just like the griffin. And the, the Sphinx is a giant lion who is guarding the entrances to the sacred underground temples under Giza, okay? And it's the gatekeeper, and it faces Leo, the constellation Leo, because what happens when you do that? Well, they believe that you embody the strength of it. So if you align yourself with Leo as the lion, it embodies the energy of the universe. And they believed and understood that that connection was pivotal to all of this. And that's why it's fascinating, though, that... The last age of Leo, if you align the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of Giza, you find that it, it's the Younger Dryas. It's like 12,000 years ago, right? Total respect for individuals like, you know, Graham Hancock and others. Love their work. But to me, it doesn't make sense that if you were going to say that they were built during that previous age of Leo, why would they build all these massive structures when it's like the end of the world? It had to have been an entire other processional flood. And that the flood we're thinking of the Younger Dryas was simply the culmination of what destroyed them all. And that's the lens that we need to get in now is looking at the human epic as three big pieces. Not two, three. The original Sumerians and then the lost world that was destroyed and then this era civilization in the golden age around the world, right? With the Peru, Bolivia, Egypt. And then they were wiped out. And then whatever came after the cultures that we know of in Assyria, in Akkadia, Babylon, 6,000 years ago, there's your third epic. Could be even four. But right now, we have at least three epics. And right, right, well, but modern academics are only, are only giving any kind of credibility to one. And that's why we have to change this entire lens in the future. OK, anybody else? Yeah. Which honestly, I don't find too logical how it this would seem to suddenly become more advanced. And then others talk more about Anunnaki and Leo and the beast. How do you see the, do you see extraterrestrials being very involved in the creation of almost like the space of the universe? Yeah, I know I was going to get that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, the universe is an incredibly vast place, okay? I don't think it's my place to explore that world. I think there's a far other people that can explore that world and come to it. I would say that absolutely some kind of an extraterrestrial life exists in the universe, far beyond like squids and octopus, okay? But I don't think that they are the ones involved in this. I think we're getting those two things confused because the more you look at the text and you read all about them and their influence on us and influencing like the, the balance of the seasons here and the energy, they're more like celestial creator gods. 
And I think we have to look at everything in the lens of two things going on. That there are incredibly powerful multidimensional beings that exist in the universe, including us, who we've forgotten who we are, and we're like the children of them. And there, of course, is life out there somewhere else. Now, how intelligent that life is, I don't know. How much of our technology we're seeing flying around is just our own secret stuff, that's a whole other conversation. But I think that for the purposes of us being taken the most credible as we can to explore these mysteries with scientists, we have to be careful to not go so far to alienate everything else. And that's a great term for that, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I'll take, how about one more question, then we gotta head over to the other room. Because it's 520 right now. Anyone else? Okay, yeah. Um, I had a question, it was like a timeline question. Sure. So you said that the Ionis uh, Teleki temple was, in your opinion, very, very, very ancient and old. Where do you think Gobekli Tepe falls on that timeline? That's a great question. Great question. So we, again, we see those same T-shaped pillars at Gobekli Tepe, right? Constellations. They, in fact, Pillar 43 has uh, a thing called, uh, a constellation on it called Cygnus or the Swan or the Vulture that's called the Northern Cross. It's actually really interesting that it has the handbag symbols right, right above it. It's like, well, wait, so that, did knowledge like come from the Cygnus constellation and from the cross? It's interesting also that that term that's been very disputed throughout history of Nibiru, not, again, not as a planet, but it means the crossing. Is that, is that a, like a multidimensional place? Is it whatever that is, they came from somewhere and they came here to create some amazing things. But so where does Gobekli Tepe fit in? Well, if that T-shaped pillar originated at Vaughn, at, at Ionis in Kef, then it seems like they were traveling around the world to build things as they went. Now, is Gobekli Tepe really 11,600 years old or is it older? Now, 11,600 years old is the date we got from radiocarbon dating, but that only gives us a benchmark for the, for the organic matter that was at the site, not the stone. You can't date stone. So if I was going to speculate based on, on, on evidence, I would say that Gobekli Tepe is far older than the younger Dryas, but younger than Ionis. And I think it was the traveling sages that were traveling west through Turkey and I think they built San Simeon, Hattusa, uh, King Midas, is, I think, was connected to the whole thing. I think that lineage and connections go all the way back. So how old goes Gobekli Tepe? At least 12,000 years old. Yes. I think Ionis, if I was going to put a number on this, and I'm probably going to be held to this, but I, would, I still want to speculate because I, I know people hate that when you don't. I would say that Ionis is 40,000 years old. Based on Zeptepi being 38,000 years old and, e and, that, and Egypt being created out of the sages of this, of the sons of Noah. Remember, Shem, Cham, and Hem. And Shem is the is one I believe that built Egypt. Shem. And I have evidence from amazing books like John Taylor in the 1800s that speculated about that. But that, that means that... So if Zeptepi is 38,000 years old based on the last processional age of Leo then this, it would make a lot of sense that this is 40,000 years old because that would give them 2,000 years to perfect their culture and then travel around the world building everything. It aligns perfectly. The whole thing aligns. And it's just falling into a narrative where we're saying, well, is human civilization you know, over 40,000 years old now, not six? And so the whole thing is getting bigger and older as we go along. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sid. Thank you. Is that better than last year?